to you. Thank you. Okay, well, welcome everybody. I um, am so excited to be here with each and every one of you and just wanna set the tone for our time together. We have an hour, hour and a half. Um, and I just wanna express gratitude for, for showing up tonight. Um, Zoom fatigue is a, is a real thing. So thank you for, for coming up and showing up for this. Um, so important to show up with a, a curious and a growth mindset. And this time that you're investing is not only for yourself, but it is for the environment and also for your community. So we have a, a lot planned. Um, that being said, I'm so excited. This is like my debut <laughs> webinar with Daily Acts. Um, and I'm so passionate about this topic of garden design. Okay? It's something that is so abstract and dynamic and really at the root of garden design is inspiration, it's creativity and it's dreaming and allowing yourself to have the permission to go into fantasy land, to go into the pie in the sky dream and to create the tools and resources to bring it in, to actualize it and create a strategy in order to really express yourself into your landscape. And this is a a really fun time to give yourself permission to observe and see what you notice around, around you as well, right? Um, we're gonna be trying to cover a lot of things, but um, my goal is to do a little bit of a lot. Um, and if I can do anything, it's, it's to spark curiosity. It's to take something that I say tonight and to run with it, to go and see where it leads you. Um, I, I hope each of you tonight are able to discover your, your inner scientist, your inner artist, um, because you get to be an architect. This is, this is really fun. It, it, it's supposed to be fun. I know that garden design can be very overwhelming. It can be daunting. We don't sometimes know how to start, where to start. Um, but I really encourage you to press into that discomfort, go to that edge and see where you can go with it um, and have, have this playfulness attitude with it because um, there's no mistakes. Okay? You have to trust the process and, and to go with it um, and see where it leads you. And there, there are no mistakes in nature. Nature is very unpredictable. We have to adapt and evolve with it. And we can observe all we want and notice the patterns, the sectors, the zones, but ultimately uh, our planet has a way of, of balancing itself out. So. Um, tonight we're gonna we're gonna kind of get curious, get some questions, and um, if you have any um, any sparks of inspiration, I encourage you to get a piece of paper and pen, um, get your notes out, jot something down. We'll be doing a really fun exercise of visualization, um, and yeah, we're gonna go ahead and and get started. So here we go. This is our outline for tonight. Um, when we start with visualization, uh, it's really important to know what we want in order to go for it, right? Um, we can dream all we want, but there is a way of creating this reality within our dreams. Um, I really love giving this example. I was one time working at a nursery and managing the greenhouse. And this woman came in to the shop and she was dead set on having this king trumpet. And it's this beautiful shrub or tree that has these overhanging um, blooms, which look like trumpets. They're, they're gorgeous and you can find them a lot in Southern California. However, this nursery is located near Sacramento, um, way different climate. And so I was expressing to her that I can, I can see her desire for wanting this plant in her yard. And there was an attachment to it. Um, but however, we're, we're in a different ecosystem um, that wouldn't necessarily support that plant. And so she felt really frustrated and left. Um, months come by, go by and she comes back to the, the nursery and she expressed that her plant failed and that um, it, it died because she couldn't, <laughs> she couldn't support it because it was too hot, right? And so it's, it's important to, um, to have a vision 
but also to have some wiggle room and knowing what can your landscape really support? How does your landscape want to grow? What wants to be there? Um, and see how you can create some compromise um, within it because you're entering into, into relationship with your, with your landscape. Um, some observations um, after you do that, we're gonna do some site factors and how to prepare your garden for your landscape. How do you prime and prep that canvas so that you can be the architect, you can, you can paint with your landscape and do those plants that have the color or um, the purpose that you want, right? This is an expression of our, our self. Um, so you can really uh, ins insert what your beliefs are. Maybe you want to create a, a water-wise habitat. And so you're gonna mindfully select plants that are drought resistant, fireproof, um, which are gonna be a lot of California natives. And by doing that, you're not only supporting the, the flora, but the fauna as well, right? As above, as below. So you're gonna be supporting the, the native fungi, mycelium, those worms, all those microorganisms. Not only that is it, it grows from the soil up. So you're gonna be supporting the native pollinators, the native birds, hummingbirds, and all of the surrounding ecosystem, which is gonna be coming to your home, which is ultimately gonna to begin to be a habitat. Um, so once we get that going, we'll, we'll do some, some fun plant selections uh, and then some actual designs. Um, I'm a very visual person, <laughs> so I, I like to see um, some examples, but of course, go, go onto Pinterest, go onto the internet, have some, some fun with there, go walk around your block, take some, take some photos and begin to see what you like, what you don't like, um, but you won't know until you kind of start to get curious with it. So for this example, uh, or for this part of our time together, um, I can't see you, you can see me, so I'll be doing this with you. But um, we're going to practice envisioning and embodying um, our dreams. So if it, it's safe for you to do so, I, I highly encourage you to close your eyes, take a deep breath, maybe breathe in for four seconds hold it and release and begin to think about your landscape visualize yourself walking out your door going to your front yard maybe your backyard noticing how does it currently look we have a lot of people that are saying it's <laughs> their guards need a lot of attention we have this blank canvas I'm going to ask you if you could dream of absolutely anything for that space, what would be there? Who would be there? Is your yard a, a space for your children, for your pets? Maybe you're a high school student or college student tuning in and you're wanting to create a community center for, for your school. What are you growing? Is there a food forest? Are you harvesting something? Are you going out to pick herbs to go cook with? Are you going out there to relax? <laughs> are you going out there to Get a spark of inspiration. Maybe there's a chicken coop. You can hear the clucking of the hens and roosters. Maybe you have a beehive and you can hear their vibration, their fluttering of their wings. We have a bird feeder and all these birds coming and going in your, your habitat. Take an extra second to really embody your dream, your vision. If you could have anything, what would it be? And really hold on to that and come back to it. You can open your eyes when you're ready a second to jot down those ideas. <laughs> a 
awesome. Thank you for doing that with me. So maybe that was a little uncomfortable or an edge for some of you. Maybe for others, that was a nice practice that you've done before. And as we begin to move forward within our process, it's good to come back to that, that center, right? And what better way to come back to center than really grounding with our actual planet, their actual environment, and developing that relationship with it, right? And we can want something <laughs> as much as we, we want and desire, um, but there are limitations around us. So think about what is compatible? What can you compromise in? Um, how does the surrounding ecosystem support your vision? But then really begin to challenge yourself with how can you also support your environment and come to this, this equilibrium and this balance? Yeah, and think about too, like what, what changes are you willing to make? Um, we'll go into like later soil, but maybe you have <laughs> a very sandy or clay soil. How are you gonna amend it to um, support the habitat and the, the species that you want in your garden? I want to bring us to one of my favorite quotes by Tommy, uh, by Toby, excuse me, Toby, who wrote Gaia's Garden, a guide to home scale permaculture, which really captures the, the key to using observation as a tool and to modeling your site after nature. And it goes, no human design designed an alpine meadow, a tropical forest or a creekside grotto. Yet these wild landscapes are never truly ugly they follow a natural or larger natural order that seems to ensure beauty. So here we're gonna start by coming back to that North Star, which is that permaculture mindset, which um, some of you might be familiar with, but permaculture in its simplest form is a design framework of observing and modeling systems after nature. And it's centered around the connections and relationships and patterns of the land. So start to see um, within your landscape, what patterns are naturally there? Are there spirals? Are there pathways, uh, nests, or waves that you can build off of? Um, and from there, we can begin to kind of see, okay, like how, how is this land already being managed? Um, and how does it want to be managed? So once you get that dream going, we're gonna begin to map it out. <laughs> So take into consideration, this is where you get your, your piece of paper out and you begin to sketch. Um, where are the property lines, right? You don't wanna start planning things and it begin to go into your neighbor's yard um, unless they're fine with that. Um, you wanna take into consideration, where is your house? What are the, some other permanent structures that you have? Um, I know when I was a little girl growing up, we had this lamp post in our front yard. Um, it didn't work but we kept it because it was aesthetically pleasing <laughs> and we would grow our plants around it. And it was really beautiful. Um, you might want to jot down um, where's the street? Um, what are some existing plants? Um, existing plants can be like annuals. So here in Sonoma County, we have the beautiful naked ladies, which are the kind of pink tulips that come in the springtime. Maybe you want to plan around that knowing that they digress and they go into their bulbs when it's no longer the season, but you can trust that they're going to come back. They're going to be consistent because they belong in the landscape and you don't want to eradicate them. You want to begin to embrace what is already there and to really edify and enhance what you want as well so that they can coexist. Um, another consideration are, are windows or doors, right? Um, I really love a good window <laughs> that's outside of my sink. So when I'm doing the dishes, I can look out and enjoy the beautification of the land. Maybe you wanna consider that um, within your planning design. <laughs> and this goes without saying, um, when doing your mapping, never trust your memory. <laughs> you're, you're gonna get caught up, especially as you're in this early stage of designing inspiration is gonna come left and right at you. Um, and then as we're being scientists, you wanna document your process. You wanna be able to collect your data and begin to see patterns. And a lot of that comes with the documentation that you begin to create. Um, this is also part of the process, right? Is as artists, I don't know any of you here are painters, but how frustrating when you're, <laughs> you're painting something and you forget what colors you mixed, right? 
and you have to go back a few steps and do trial and error. This helps to kind of keep all your ducks in a row and to keep you moving forward. Um, this is really helpful even if you just have a raised garden bed. You can know by seasonally like what you what you planted. So maybe last year you planted something and it did not do well. You probably don't want to plant it again. Um, and this is really good for um, by season. So maybe you did tomatoes um, and you want to do a natural amendment. So you plant green beans and that helps to fix the nitrogen, which um, tomatoes take a lot of. Um, so yeah, we're going to keep going into like now how do we create um, our designs. A foul proof way is what I, I have always started with, with doing is get a tape measure and grid paper. When I was first doing my backyard, I, I took my cell phone and just took photos and went out with a tape measure and <laughs> wrote down the measurements that way. That works too. That's a, that was my broke college student tip that I did. <laughs> You can also see if you have the privilege and access, see existing maps of your property, or you can go into Google Earth. This is really helpful. Um, I will warn that if you have a large canopy of trees, um, it can be kind of hard to see those really acute details that might be needed as you do more of your planning and prep work. Um, and if you're wanting to also create a base map, can use drones, maybe you have someone that is really eager with the drone use. <laughs> I personally don't know too many people around me, but if you have that network of support, definitely press in, tap into those uh, resources. Um, and then, of course, last but not least, this might go into the, the end of the spectrum, but you can hire out a professional to create your base map um, design or picture going to get a little bit more pricey, but if you're wanting something really specific that you're wanting to invest into, that's a perfectly fine route uh, as well. So let's do some visualizations, use some examples. And um, this is something like a, a tape measure, graph and paper will look like. Um, this is really good to kind of get everything together. Let me see if I can do my little laser pointer. Nice. So we have our patio here. Um, I recommend color coordinating again, visualization. Um, this is a really great way to, if you're wanting to like extend your patio, you can do a different color or highlight things that you're wanting to add. Maybe you can do things that are pre-existing there. Shrubs can be a different color, annuals, perennials. Um, get artistic with it, have some fun, make it however you'd like. Um, it's quite beautiful, I think. <laughs> So you can um, add your own touch to it or whatever makes sense for you. Um, once you begin to kind of lay out what's existing there structurally, you want to start to look at and track the patterns that you're seeing. So if you do have time, I highly recommend if you're in your early stages of designing and planning, um, if you have like a full year, that's really great because you can see like where the sun is moving throughout the season. Um, sectors are really important for yeah sun exposure. You can't really change where the sun <laughs> the sun goes. Um, you can maybe control how much shade your area is getting by certain plants. Um, but if you want like a, a plant that requires like six to eight hours of sunlight, but you don't get that, you're probably going to need to choose plants that can handle like four hours of sun. And there's a lot of options for you to still be able to choose from, but you wanna set your species up for success. Um, other things that you wanna take into consideration is wind. Um, where, where does it get really windy? Again, I was working at the nursery and someone came because they were really frustrated that they weren't getting any um, tomatoes from their tomato plants. <laughs> and I asked where they're located and they're kind of near the Delta. Um, where I'm from as well, uh, originally from, and it was really windy. So the wind was blowing off all of their blooms. So of course they're unable to, <laughs> to get any production that way. So you wanna take that into consideration so that you can plan accordingly and um, maybe plant something that will block the wind or provide a structure so that your vegetables or fruit have 
the best chance of production. Um, you might want to take into consideration what the foot traffic is. If there's animals, we saw someone in the chat that had like a gopher problem. Um, maybe take into consideration uh, pollution that might be happening. I know it seems like we get monsoons <laughs> nowadays. Um, so it might have a lot of flooding that occurs on your land. Um, this is really great for sectors to create those analysis so that you can plan accordingly. And being in the, the place that we are, we also have to take fires into consideration. Um, sectors are a really great way to fireproof your area as well. So making sure that there's no opportunity for fire ladders to occur um, and knowing like where things land. Maybe you have, I have a big pine tree in my front yard um, and we have to do pruning at the end of this or cleaning up at the end of the season because that's a, a fire hazard. Um, which brings us to <laughs> opportunities, constraints, and on, on-site resources. <laughs> um, once we have an idea of where we're going and um, our map and how that's looking, we're ready to get started. Um, but of course, sometimes things have a mind of their own and we have to adapt with it. So as we hear, see here, sorry, my laser pointer, a big pile of rocks. So maybe as you were beginning to create your raised bed and pulling out dirt to amend it, you see a bunch of rocks. Or in that monsoon, you see how the water piles next to um, your house in this specific area of your lawn, where you have those very um, persistent and resilient gophers and groundhogs there. Or maybe you have some a, a lot of shade. Um, these are opportunities where we can, you know, really embrace that permaculture mindset um, and work with our landscape and what's there and embrace it. So instead of seeing these as like frustrations, maybe we utilize those rocks and we use it to build our raised bed, or maybe we see those, uh, those gophers or groundhogs as an opportunity to create habitat for um, intentionally inviting those apex um, creatures to come into our, our yards. So maybe we set up an, an owl box so that we invite the owls um, and it creates that symbiotic um, relationship with the land where they mediate our gopher problems. Um, for the redwood area with a lot of shade, we pick plants like Yerba Buena or other items that really thrive in a lot of shade. Um, you're not doomed. <laughs> you're just embracing an opportunity to adapt and be like nature. And with the area that really swells with a lot of water, how exciting. You have an opportunity to create a, a little swell or a little pool garden or bog garden and there's still a ton of salvias that you can choose from and other species which thrive in that habitat. Um, and this is the, the place where you can really embrace the permaculture and the natural designs of how our landscape wants to be worked and managed and be in relation with. So in that, that essence of really embracing um, and beginning to selectively and consciously choose our plants, um, we want to think about how we're going to be watering them and how we can choose um, the best water solutions, which is being um, mindful of, you know, being in a drought at this moment. Um, here at Daily Acts, we're all about slow it, spread it, sink it, and store it. And there's some very creative ways to capture and reuse rainwater. So, Maybe you have a greenhouse or you have a chicken coop and you wanna be able to collect that water or you wanna collect the water that's flying from your roof. Um, I'd say maybe check out investing into um, some blue barrels here. This one in this picture right above, those are about 55 gallons of food grade recycled um, blue barrels. Um, and this is a re really great way to do it yourself um, and it's a really low cost um, resource and tool. Um, as you can see, the water is coming from the larger structure and it's being fed into the barrels that is uh, daisy chained together. So ultimately you have about 
220 gallons of storage capacity that is now attached to your garden hose and you can water your plants and garden with. Um, if you're curious about this method, there's a, a really great resource called Blue Barrel Rainwater Catchment Systems. Um, the owner is Jesse Savo, and they've done a lot of amazing uh, workshops here with us at Daily Acts. If you're curious about that, you can go onto our website and we have a lot of our, um, all of our previous recordings from um, previous webinars that you can check out there. Um, and Blue Barrel Rainwater Catchment Systems, they also have a really amazing website with full um, of do-it-yourself do tools and tutorials that you, you can check out. Furthermore, um, <laughs> if you're wanting to store water and really collect as much as you can and you have a, the property which can support this, maybe you want to check out this larger rain, uh, rain tank. This is like about 5,000 gallons. Um, really great. I know that I don't have the space, <laughs> so I'm, I'm pretty uh, um, interested in this one here, which is actually at one of our city halls in downtown Petaluma. It's collecting rainwater, which is coming from the roof and feeding it into the rain garden here. So it's coming down, it's being collected, it's meandering to the storage drain. I know there is a, you might be worried about the pollution or the contamination of it going straight to our water waste system. Um, <clears throat> but as it's being fed through the land, it's that, that concept of sinking and storing. Um, it's being filtered by the mulch and it's also being filtered by the root system. So by the time that it, the excess water that is no longer, that's not needed, um, and it does flow to the water drain system, it's cleaned, it's been naturally purified. And this is, really helping and supporting the local ecology of the habitat that you're supporting. And it's gonna be a lot more clean than if it's just kind of fallen and run into the gutter system, right? It's not gonna collect those leaves and other debris um, that we're not wanting to go and contaminate our aquifers. All right, the water piece. I'm really excited about this. So as we're talking about alternative water solutions, we can also talk about alternative pets. <laughs> um, I've been a beekeeper for the last five years. Of course, they're not pets, but if you're creating a, um, so that if you build it, they will come. <laughs> so if you build a pollinator garden, those pollinators will come. Um, and so maybe on your, as you're designing, you wanna take into consideration and collaboration for some, some wildlife that you wanna support. Right, we have a, a chicken coop here. You wanna be really mindful of where you put that in your design. So you wanna be able to, to give them some shade. So maybe you plan on planting a tree, right? And also be very mindful of your tree, right? You don't wanna plant a, a large fruit like an apple or peach. I'm sure the chickens won't really enjoy that <laughs> if they fall. Um, but you might, you can still utilize that space and grow something like, you know, even cherries, which are smaller or um, like a cherry, those have cherry blossoms, which are really beautiful. You can put in a bird feeder, a hummingbird feeder, um, big fan of worm composting. Maybe you want to start uh, having some pets like worms. Those are really great. Right. And you can really utilize this space too. It's not just a chicken coop, but again, you can insert <clears throat> and put a rainwater system here so you can begin to catch um, and use every part of your land to really uphold um, the morals of your landscape design. So if you wanna be as sustainable as possible, as minimalistic, um, or really utilize the space, um, try to do <laughs> two birds with one stone and try to do as much as you can with as little as you can as well. Um, you can also consider like putting um, specific plants around your chicken coop, like comfrey, which chickens absolutely love. Comfrey also helps the shells of chicken eggs to be a little bit more hardy. Um, you can also consider putting your compost bin next to your chickens, right? Anything extra, you can just kind of have it right by them. Also, you don't want to put your compost directly in sunlight. You also want that in shade as well, so you can regulate the temperature. Uh, making sure that it's staying at that perfect homeostasis that it needs in order to get all the micro um, biomes and microorganisms that it needs to decompose and compost um, as it moves forward. 
as we're talking about soil, right? How do we begin to build from the ground up? Um, right? As we really focus on nurturing our soil, we're also putting into consideration um, water conservation, right? Dry soil causes runoff, but when soil is wet and it's healthy, it saturates, it sinks that water, it helps the microorganisms so that your plant can thrive. Um, you build up the food web system, right? We have this amazing famous quote by Franklin Roosevelt that says, the nation that destroys its soil destroys itself. <laughs> um, by keeping soil wet and moist, we allow a richer and more diverse my microbial environment that helps our plants thrive. Having healthy soil is a great way to carbon sink um, through um, storing the atmospheric carbon and storing it in the soil to support our plants, our planet, and ultimately even ourselves. Um, as we're getting into relationship with our soil, um, you can do a percolization test, um, right? Part of having healthy soil is knowing what type of soil we do have. What are we currently working with? Uh, most people here in Sonoma probably are working with uh, clay or clay loam soil. And this percolization test helps us to know uh, what plants we should grow, um, what um, will thrive within this environment. Um, so we know mindfully what we can plant and what is um, what the different soil characteristics will support. Um, and if this is something that um, interests you and you're wanting to actually test, we have some really great re resources on our website. Um, and this can help to inform you and to conduct your own fertilization test for your landscape. Another really do-it-yourself um, test that you can do is the ribbon test. So you're actually gonna wanna go out into your landscape, get your hands deep into the earth. Um, you wanna make sure that the soil is damp or moist. And this is where you're wanting to kind of rub um, the soil between your fingers. If it crumbles really quickly, then you more than likely have sandy soil. Um, and that will be more of like our West County residents that have a higher uh, sand levels within their yards. If you're rubbing the soil between your fingers and you're able to make um, a ribbon which is less than 2.5 or five centimeters, um, then more than likely you have loam soil or loam clay. And anything larger than that, it's gonna be mostly just clay. <laughs> um, and this is a really great way to test on the spot. Um, if you do need more resources, we have that also accessible on our website. Uh, this test is really important and great to do um, if you're needing to amend or know how to amend your soil to support the species of plants that you're wanting to um, be in your habitat. So once we have that all prepped and prepared, we're ready to prime our canvas. Um, we are a big fan of using this recipe. Um, <clears throat> uh, you do, you start by uh, mulching. So you start by edging your landscape. So going in and edging about inch, excuse me, two inches in. And then you wanna add two layers of compost, one inch, or excuse me, two layers of cardboard, and then one inch of compost and about three inches of mulch. Um, this is a really great method to help to prep your landscape. Mulching is a, um, also a really great method which suppresses weeds and helps to conserve water. Um, you can actually help conserve about 12 to 25 gallons per square foot, um, which is really awesome. And so when you do your edging, that helps so that the dirt or um, mulch doesn't go onto the concrete. The mulch goes in um, and it helps to store so that there's no sunlight that goes in to help germinate any, any weeds or seeds that you're wanting to um, eradicate in your yard. We have some pretty aggressive um, Bermuda grass here in Sonoma County. So um, you can be a little bit more aggressive with your mulching. So maybe you wanna do an extra inch or two of mulch to help to um, eradicate that problem. Um, we do only recommend we or advocate on three inches um, based upon what Fire Safe Marin um, allocated for, just to have the most prone, safe fire habitat. Um, 
but depending on what your landscape needs are, you might need to go deeper or add a little bit more. So this is an example of rolling out the cardboard. Uh, there's two different types of cardboard that you can use. Um, you can go to Grab and Grow here in Sonoma County and get three to four feet. Um, and this is really great if you have a large area or you're wanting to do more in a short amount of time, you just take it, roll it out. Uh, maybe you're wanting to do more recycling. So you go to um, local grocery stores, fast food restaurants or um, gas stations. Those also have an excess of boxes. Uh, maybe you have neighbors that um, have a lot of boxes as well. We're about to go into the holidays. A lot of people are, might be ordering online. So you can put up, an, <laughs> put up a flyer in your neighborhood saying that you want to collect boxes. This is a really great way to get your community involved, get your family involved in this project. Um, this is winter. This is a really great time to do your prep work, do your foundational work. Um, Mulching is a really great time in the, this season because you want to be able to store as much water as you can um, and help. When you do this process, the water is saved within the mulch. You can begin to help create the microorganisms as they do their thing through that composting process. So come spring, you're going to be have um, a really healthy environment to support your budding plants, which are, are ready to be in the ground. Um, here we have an example of spreading the mulch. Again, you wanna do about three inches of mulch layer, maybe more depending on your environment or weeds that you're wanting to suppress. Um, note, as, the, as you move forward, you wanna make sure that um, as you're planting and you're mulching, uh, you can either plant last or you can plant first and cut around um, cut the cardboard around the plants. Um, but it's very important when you're mulching to leave a radius around the plant because if you mulch up to the base of the plant, it can cause um, rotting. So if you plant around it, think about it, that you're trying to support the root system. The roots aren't just at the plants. It goes out and it goes deep. And so that's the mindset that you wanna kind of really be catering and nurturing. Okay, right, so now, get to the fun part, the planting. What are we gonna be planting? What's gonna go there? We, are, we know now how to get that base going. So where is it going? What is going in there? Um, <clears throat> so as we get started, think about anchoring features. What are you, that? I'm thinking of that light post, right? That I said earlier in our, in our time together. You may wanna choose instead of a light post, anchoring trees or shrubs that really catches your attention. Um, that will be our focal point. You might want to have um, a lounge area or a fountain, really some space that you're going to, that your eye is going to draw attention and, att and attraction to. So that when you're out there enjoying your space, um, everything is kind of balancing out. You begin to create dimensions um, that feel virtually pleasing. <laughs> you then are also taking into consideration as pathways. Maybe you have like a solid pathway that you want. Maybe you have these like little blocks that kind of pop as you're going. You can plant some creeping um, ground cover plants. There's like creeping chamomile, right? That can go right in between these spaces. That lead, lead your eye. Maybe you have like a retaining ball. You wanna plant some ivy along it, some lilac, some jasmine. Take all that into consideration. Maybe you don't have the space for a big tree, but you can plant something small and have it go out. A few of my favorite trees that we're gonna suggest um, are the coast live oak, right? We have plenty of those here in California. They thrive here. They have adapted for these really dry um, summers and they are do really well, limited amount of water. Um, maybe an olive tree, some citrus, <laughs> manzanilla. All these also offer a lot of, um, those citrus and manzanilla offer really great blooms for pollinators. Olive trees are really great for, for birds. Maybe you're wanting to support a habitat to invite them into your yard to build nests. Some fun shrubs that are evergreen. So evergreen meaning that so they won't have buds all year round, right? That'd be a perennial. Evergreen means that they'll stay 
evergreen throughout the, the season. So you can choose the Ceonophis. Um, Ceonophis are California native as well. Um, they bloom a lot in early spring and late fall. So it really helps to get those pollinators started or give them that last kind of push at the end of the season to get all the resources that you need to survive the winter that's coming. You can do a pineapple guava, <laughs> which is uh, actually the, the flowers and the fruit edible. Um, coffee berry, this is really, again, really supportive for birds, um, the fruit and also the habitat that is in, in them. <clears throat> um, my favorite is bottle brush. Um, it's named bottle brush because it looks like um, a bottle brush that you could clean with. Um, pollinators, bees absolutely love this. I think that has such a a deep red that is so beautiful and eye-catching. Um, so that's always one of my favorites that I always love to recommend. Bottle brush is really great as well because it can get to be really big, but if you prune it back or if you um, give it a little bit less light, things like that, it helps to control how big it will get as well. Mm, some more shrubs. Um, we have this bush bush, we have the lemonberry, coyote bush. Um, I was one, one summer doing an internship with Pollinator Partnership and we we're studying different plants in these, um, these right of ways and counting to see how many pollinators were going to specific plants. And in one of my sectors, I was looking at coyote bush or brush. And I think I saw over 37 different species of pollinators that were coming and going. I've never seen um, a bush have so much activity on it. Um, so I really recommend this one if you're wanting to, again, support pollinator life within your, your um, landscape. Another one of my favorites <laughs> that I always had growing up um, was a butterfly bush or budlia. Um, there is a wide range of colors that you can choose from. Um, I love it too because it smells it smells like honey. Um, and this is really great if maybe um, you want to plant this or like marigold next to your trash cans. So when you're going out to take out your trash, it doesn't have a, a foul odor that you might not want to smell. Um, you might have a lovely scent of honey now as you as you go to take out your trash. Right, and as you continue to take into consideration what to plant and where to start, um, I like to think about how, how many benefits can I get from this plant or element. Uh, when I, again, when I was working at the nursery and I was trying to learn all these species, I felt so overwhelmed. I thought that oregano was only a culinary item, <laughs> but lo and behold, um, there's not just Italian oregano, there's tarragon, which is a subspecies, there's um, sitar, there's Mexican oregano, there's Greek oregano, <laughs> the list can go on. Um, there's also ornamental oregano. <laughs> so um, to help to break it down so you don't get overwhelmed, um, try to think about um, how much you can get more bang for your buck. How many boxes does this plant tick? If you can get a plant that at least has two of these features, I'd say go for it, right? So maybe it's a water, it's water wise, has uh, needs a, limit, a limited amount of water. Maybe it provides a habitat. So we think of the coffee berry, maybe it's edible, um, like chamomile, yarrow, fever food. They're edible, they're culinary, but it's also medicinal. Um, and I think another really important thing to check off is if it's beautiful, if you enjoy it, that's a good enough reason to have something in your yard is because you simply enjoy it or you simply want it. Um, so think about this as you're moving forward. Um, and especially if you have a limited amount of space. <laughs> and when I'm using the word water wise, um, I know and I didn't really <laughs> know what that meant when I was getting started. Um, here in, in Sonoma County, you, you don't necessarily need me to tell you why uh, it's important to have water wise plants. Uh, we're all living within this experience of needing to conserve water and be really mindful <clears throat> of what we're putting in our landscape and what we're getting out. So a lot of native plants 
have adapted for this, this drier climate that doesn't need a lot of water. Um, and when we choose those native plants, again, we're supporting the native fungi and the fauna and flora, which rely upon it. Um, water or plants that are not water wise, they're going to require a lot more attention, a lot more water. That's going to um, pull from our resources and our aquifers. <clears throat> so some characteristics of water wise plants is that they're, they're a little bit more fuzzy or waxy or crisp like the, the live oak here. Um, bulbs, a lot of the bulbs will, uh, or plants will be more green in the winter time, right? As we're getting um, more rain, but then they'll be more dry. Um, so the, the leaves are gonna be of a different texture. That's really great, we want that. Um, <clears throat> these plants here, you might be able to opt into them if you have that shaded area, like with the big redwood growth <laughs> in your yard, you might wanna select items like ferns. Um, you won't have to do as much watering because the area is shaded, but this might be a good option for you if you're needing to um, create some alternatives. <clears throat> and this brings us to the, the great debate, uh, non-native plants versus native plants. Thanks, water break. <laughs> uh, my rule of thumb is uh, any time that you can go with a native plant, I say it's probably your best bet. Is it necessary? Not necessarily. I think we <clears throat> here in California have a lot of beautiful options to choose from. Um, but if there's something else that can supplement your garden needs, um, first see if there's a native plant that can fill that niche. But if not, you can still opt into some other, um, other plants that fill that category that you're wanting. So if you want a specific color or a specific texture, um, you can go for that. Native plants have co-adapted for this area and provide mutually beneficial relationships with the surrounding environment. Um, so here we have like sticky monkey, um, pink flowering currant, artemisia, Cleveland sage, and some pestamens. You can throw in and sprinkle some wildflowers for more um, meadow look that feels a little bit more airy, right? I love this picture. It's just so many colors to choose from. As so I talk about um, native versus non-native and being able to be mindful of our selection, I think back to the woman that came to the nursery. Um, she was um, wanting a plant that thrived more on hotter, it's a different type of humidity, right, in Southern California than here in Northern, especially where I was where the nursery was closer to Sacramento, completely different <laughs> than Southern California. Um, here in like Sonoma County, uh, we have a Mediterranean, uh, Mediterranean um, climate. Um, so meaning that a Mediterranean climate is gonna have really hot, really dry summers and cool wet winters. Um, and it's located around 30 degrees to 45 uh, degrees latitude north um, and south of the equator on the Western sides of the continents. Um, when selecting your plants, you also want to maybe check with local nurseries or experienced gardeners to see what has been analog to be really successful um, in your area. Right? Um, there's a lot of great plants that you can choose from. Right? There's like Jerusalem sage, some other really great plants that do well is um, like eucalyptus. Those are um, plants that have similar climates to like Australia or Chile which also have Mediterranean climates as well. So here's a, a picture of like Jerusalem sage, which I think is so beautiful. You can um, cut them and dry and they make lovely arrangements. They also take up a pretty nice space, use a little bit, a limited amount of water. Um, you have the Chilean guava, which adds a really nice kind of very drooping uh, some color um, or drooping texture for your garden, nice little pop. As we're thinking about though, in the continuation of native versus non-native plants, um, when you do plant native species, you're not only just planting <clears throat> for that plant, but you're creating a habitat for other native species that might be outcompeted by um, right, invasive species that we're inviting in, even though they're not native. So this one here invites over 537 species of caterpillars versus this uh, non-native plant, which only supports 
or species of caterpillars. Right, and as we're going forward, we're checking in to see what is going to be able to grow um, in our garden. We have some opportunists, right? So here we have the Bermuda grass, <laughs> um, which is pretty aggressive or very persistent, depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, we have some scotch broom, some ice plants for English ivy. There's going to be some level of management to mediate some of the, the plants which have been um, invited onto our landscape, right? There's, as we're living in this Anthropocene, there's no land really that is this concept of being pristine or untouched, right? So we have to mediate um, some of these invasive species and make sure that they're not out competing the, the selected plants that we want to be growing um, with the native species. So, and as we're choosing our colors, this gets really fun. This is again for the painters. Um, you wanna do like some complementary colors. We have the, the purple and the yellow, um, which in, in, in the wild or in nature, those colors have adapted together because they look really well for pollinators. They're able to pick up on those ultraviolet lights and they complement each other and they help the other get more pollinated. Um, you might wanna choose some tertiary colors or color sequencing and you know, colors have an effect on our mood. So maybe you wanna choose some really beautiful, cool tones. <laughs> and I see this, this array of selections. I feel really calm, I feel really tranquil. And maybe that's a, a sensation that you're wanting to feel when you're in your garden. Maybe when you go into your garden, you want to feel a splash of vibrancy, of inspiration, pops of color. You want to put in that kangaroo paw, some birds of paradise, some, um, some rukabikia or agastashi to really create some dimensions and some colors and some vibrancy that helps um, things stand out. Right, and here we have some textures, right? We have this beautiful grass right here, which is a little bit more spiky. So our eye goes up and things are, are down um, below it. It's gonna be a little bit more softer. We have that pop of color. Um, maybe you want some deer grass so that the grass that is growing is a little bit more softer, more whimsical. And we have some dimensions again, we have that fountain there. This is a really fun way to create um, your artistic expression. I have a, a cousin that <laughs> is a tattoo artist. Um, they're very artistic and have a very beautiful aesthetic. Um, so I helped them design their garden where everything in their front yard is all black plants, um, right? So we even have a, that Budlia that I was saying that has like so many colors to choose from. It blooms black petals. It's beautiful, it's stunning. Um, you can choose plants that have like that deep maroon color. Um, and I know for me, for my aesthetic, I really love very, um, like I love having like a fairy garden that's very whimsical and airy and flowy and um, maybe a little messy, right? So this is your chance to kind of see like, what is your feel? Do you like things very um, clean? Do you like space? Does it help you to feel more calm? Or when you see that space, do you feel like there should be something there that needs to be filled? Um, you can design based on what feels good for you and how you want to represent yourself and be seen within your community. As we're selecting our plants, uh, we have to embrace se seasonality. Um, again, as a little girl, I had the worst time <laughs> being able to figure out time. Um, I used to love making bagels in the morning and in the summertime, I thought it was so much fun to be able to go out into my garden and pick strawberries. And I was very confused when autumn came and I wasn't able to pick my strawberries anymore. Um, and that was the lesson that I learned that certain fruits and vegetables and blooms are gonna depend upon the season. Um, as a beekeeper, I love to make sure that there's something in my garden all year round, right? We hear that token term, save the bees. Um, and I get asked all the time, like how, how can I help to save the bees? And the number one thing that I love to tell people is to provide a food forest um, that offers a wide selection for bees to choose from and to make sure that 
it's safe and healthy for them. So not spraying and making sure that um, they have something to choose from all year round. Um, so this is a really great map to be able to distinguish when things are gonna be growing, when they're not. So maybe you, you want some lavender in your yard, which is an amazing plant to have. Um, but you don't want to plant all lavenders, right? Because they all <laughs> grow within June and July, then afterwards you have to prune it. So you maybe want to add in a diversity of things that have like a longer bloom period versus a shorter and make sure that you're planting strategically so you don't have a large amount of empty space. Right, and so here are some fruit trees. This goes to, again, you don't want to plant all apple trees, right? If you plant five of them, you want to make sure that you strategically plan and choose the correct plants because you don't want to have like a bunch of apples that you're harvesting at one time. You want to add diversity. We all love diversity and it's needed for our ecosystem. So you might want to plant a fig tree or a persimmon, service berry or pomegranates. Um, this helps to add color, helps to add harvest. Um, and keeps us in a state of, of abundance of sustainability so that things aren't going to waste. Some smaller evergreens, we have some rosemary. Um, the bees are loving it right now. They're still being able to, to go out and, and poll pollinate and to collect resources for their hive. Um, we have lavender. There's a, a huge selection of lavender that you can choose from ranging from um, long stems, which are going to be more of like your French lavender, which you'll want to like do more baking with, or you can do more compacted lavenders like English lavender, which is really good to, to cook with. We have one of my favorite poppies here. Um, the common name is fried eggplant, <laughs> and I love it because it actually looks like a fried eggplant. Um, another favorite of mine is globe mallow. This picture does not do this plant justice. It is the most stunning coral color. Um, and it has like really large stems that add this like airiness. Um, and this is really good if you want something then like really short and stub stubby like that English lavender in your front right above it. Can't recommend this enough. I love it. It's also a California native. So checks that box and another box. All right, some reliable salvias. I love this, not because just because it has a great name, but salvias in general are Fantastic. You can't go wrong with them. This is hot lips. Um, it has, from what I've observed, it has one of the longest blooming periods. It starts really early um, in the in the spring. Technically, it should go to like the end of spring, beginning of summer, but I've I've seen the salvia go all the way into fall. Um, I love it. It's very um, enthusiastic, it can get pretty robust. Um, and you can, there's no wrong way to prune salvias, I think. So if you're new and you aren't too sure how to do pruning, you can't go wrong with salvias. Another favorite of mine is we, uh, bee bliss. Um, again, beekeeper, so I'm thinking about my bees. Um, this is really great, not just for honeybees, but also for native bees. Um, fun fact, honeybees, they go for more for like nectar. So we have like the pineapple sage here that has that long tube. Um, which honeybees, hummingbirds, they have that long tongue, which can get to those centers. But for like carpenter bees, surface flies, bumblebees, bumblelids, they want more of that pollen. Um, and so bee spliss is really good for supporting those species if you're wanting to invite them onto your land. And then again, another really great long per blooming period uh, sage is gonna be the Mexican bush sage. Those are like the really beautiful purple that has like the little tip um, to petal that comes off of it. Um, it's purple, but you can also get it in pink. You can get it in white. There's a lot of varieties for you to choose from. Moving forward, we have our grasses and grass-like plants. So we have the California gray um, rush, a little bit more compact. We have the deer grass, a little bit more flowy, a little bit more robust. And then I also love to recommend um, lemongrass. So again, you're choosing a plant that can do multiple things. Um, it's a culinary, it's medicinal, it's aesthetically pleasing, takes up a nice amount of space. Um, and then of course you can go into sedges as well if you're wanting something a little bit more compact, um, but equally just as beautiful and colorful if you're needing to fill in some space. 
or they do really good isolated as well if you're wanting um, some more openness to your land and your landscape. Just because I can't get enough of it, here's some more really bright fillers and evergreens. We have our Agasashi. Again, so many colors for you to choose from. Um, these are really great. They're edible as well. You can pick the flowers and infuse it into your water. Really good if you're wanting to um, attract like hummingbirds. We have yarrow, another really great color that you can add to your land. Depending on what you select, you can also get a medicinal yarrow, which is really great and has a lot of benefits. Um, scented geraniums, so many colors, so many smells. Um, cannot go wrong with them. One of my favorites is um, rose. It's like a scented rose or you can get peppermint, which is really fun. <laughs> so I love to go in and just like rub my hands and be able to smell and enjoy. Um, and then penstemon. There's a lot of California native penstemons. This is beer tongue, has this beautiful like ultraviolet color, um, which is really unique. And I like to have this one in a garden as well. As we begin to create and move through those dimensions, we're gonna think about ground covers. So we have like creeping thyme, really great for, for bees or those ones that are a little bit smaller, like our tiny carpenter bees um, or surfid flies. Um, I love lamb's ear. It's basically begging for you to touch it, to pick it and just feel that fuzziness. Um, it gets these really beautiful tall blooms, which is really great for cutting if you're wanting to make uh, floral arrangements. Um, really beautiful purple. It attracts a lot of pollinators. Um, I also love, I don't have this included, but borage. Borage is a really great addition for pollinators. It replenishes its nectar like every 15 minutes. So you're constantly going to be resourcing those bees and pollinators that are coming in, that are hungry and looking um, for food. You can also use their flowers. It's a natural coolant. So if you want to cool down your water, um, you can put those into your water and it adds like this cucumber taste, which is really interesting. There's California um, fuchsia, which is um, epilodium. Really beautiful color. Again, a California native. So many diverse options for you to choose from. And then we also have some creeping sage, which stays low. This does really well in like a rock garden as well. Um, it thrives within a little bit of loose soil. So this is really good if you have a little bit more sandy. Um, I would recommend this one. A nice little pop of color. Some say, or shade in, um, enjoying plants. That yerba buena, it's California native, really good for culinary. Um, coral bells has that really delicate, airy um, topper to it. Um, foxglove, hydrangeas, right? <laughs> so many things for you to choose from. Okay, so we're gonna go into some examples now. Awesome. Moving th through things, I'm really, ex really excited to see some of your questions and interact. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for listening. All right, so here we have some examples of this layout, beautiful color coordination. Um, my only thing that I would recommend here is to make sure that you're putting in um, where like your north, south, east, and west is. It's very important, especially as you're developing the sectors um, and knowing where the sun is setting, where the wind is coming. Here's another really great picture, putting things to see their, their actual size to know how big things are going to get. Um, it's really important to be patient with your plants um, and to embrace the growing process and growing period. Um, so you might see some empty space. Um, just know that within the next year or two, they're going to fill out. So I like having a design plan for when I'm beginning and then maybe when thing, what I'm expecting things to look like. So you can begin to fill things out, knowing how tall as well. Being able to ask um, experienced gardeners as well hey, realistically, how, how does this plant do? Ask local nurseries or go, when you go around your neighborhood, you can begin to take inventory on what's successful in that area, or uh, maybe if something isn't successful, you can think about maybe why is it being optimized to its full potential and what can you do to support 
and your um, your landscape and provide for those needs so that you can see it thrive, um, right? I'm thinking back to like when that the woman came in and she wanted the king's trumpet, there were solutions for her. If she really wanted that plant, I'm not saying that like you can't have it, you're just gonna have to work a little bit harder for it to be supported within your ecosystem. So maybe you wanna make sure that you choose a plant knowing that this area, this area in your yard gets a little bit more shade. You'll wanna put something that can handle and tolerate that than putting it directly over here that might be getting direct sunlight eight hours a day. All right, so as we're beginning to think of our process, embrace that canvas, see, see it for its full potential here and knowing that there, there's a process to it and that as you begin to be patient with it, and you treat it with the love, care, and respect that it ultimately is going to reciprocate that for you as well. <laughs> um, this is for one of our sites here. This is another one of my favorites here. We see all the beautiful pathways and patterns. And finally, dream big, right? There's so many options for you to choose from, big pie in the sky. There's no, it's never too late or too early to be dreaming of what you're wanting to do with your landscape. I live here in Oakland and I have a small backyard, which I feel so honored and privileged to have, but I someday think about owning, owning land and being able to steward it. Um, and so I create these designs of like, okay, if I could do anything and have my dream, what would it be? What would it look like? Um, Maybe I want to make sure that someday I'm taking into consideration doing a laundry to landscape and I want to reuse water. I can begin to kind of design, okay, where is the hardscape going to be? How am I going to get water from over here all the way over there? And you can plan ahead and avoid certain problems down the road. Um, here we have one of our executive directors. Um, this is his land. And as you can see, he had a few grasses. If he observed that that was something that was pre-existing that he wanted to support further down the line. Um, but then he was able to kind of fill in those spaces um, and create a process for him that really represented what he believes in and what he wanted to see and how he wanted to enjoy the landscape, what's currently there and how can you further kind of collaborate with what he's wanting and what the land is wanting as well, right? We're being in relation with it. It's another example of one of our sites. We have some beautiful salvias, right? The, the opportunities are endless for you. Um, and I hope that you're leaving today feeling inspired and excited and knowing that there, there are options for you and that you can begin to kind of get curious. Um, and of course, if you have any questions, um, we are here in resources for you to um, access us. And if we don't have the answers, we are more than happy to, to direct you to those solutions. So thank you so much for everyone that has stayed on with us. Just some kind of final notes before we jump into those questions. Um, we are hiring. We are looking for a bilingual programs coordinator. Um, if you're interested or know someone that may be interested, um, you can go on to dailyacts.org and job openings. We will also be having um, another event happening December 16th. It's not live on our site right now, but please stay tuned. Um, in a few days, I'll be sending up a follow-up email with a lot of the resources, a recording of our webinar in time tonight. And I will be sure to include an invitation to um, our next event that we'll be hosting, which is on zero waste during the holidays. Last but not least, we wanna thank all of our amazing sponsors. Um, for being able to support us so we, that we can continue to support all of you. And yeah, thank you so much for your time tonight. I really <laughs> appreciate it. Um, and I felt so welcome, especially this being my first webinar. So thank you. <laughs> I'm looking forward to reading some of your questions. Beautiful, Corey. Thank you. And um, just wanted to, again, express gratitude to the town of Windsor uh, for making this possible. Um, if you if you enjoy the work that you do, if you feel aligned with our uh, with our mission and our values, um, we're as much fueled by donations as we are by our contracts with wonderful partners like the town of Windsor. So we would invite you to feel free to to give generously on our website.
And so with that, um, let's get into some questions. So we have some that came in pretty early in the presentation. So I, I think we'll just kind of go through line by line there. So Corey, we can kind of tag team these as we go through. So the first one is uh, Deborah says, gophers, bulls, moles, and badgers. Population explosion on her property off uh, Bloomfield Road, three acres that looks like it's been hit with buckshot. Um, that sounds familiar for Sonoma County. Um, so the first thing that occurs to me anyway is uh, it's pretty amazing that you have badgers on your property. They're a species of special concern here in California and they're predators, right? Like the badgers are hunting your gophers, voles, and moles. So that is actually working to your advantage in that regard. Um, I don't have like the uh, a silver bullet for dealing with gophers, bulls, and moles. There are a lot of things you can do, like Corey touched on, um, inviting biodiversity into your site by creating habitat for other predators. Um, of course, there are lots of products you can try, but what do you think, Corey? Um, what I've done with some gardens that I've helped to manage is going to the source of bulls. You can get like a cotton ball um, and put some peppermint oil and that helps to kind of push them out of the area. It doesn't completely eradicate them. Um, <laughs> um, that's something that I've advocated for before. Yeah. The only other thing I would mention since you're working with, you know, three acres here, um, you know, you might consider partnering up with someone who does community grazing to sort of rehabilitate the soil on your site. And kind of as the ecosystem that is your landscape comes more into balance, you know, you can think about what can you plant that will feed gophers, voles, and moles that might keep them from going after the plants you don't want them to eat. Like that fried egg plant Corey showed us is considered gopher food. You might think about what you can plant that is gopher resistant, which is a lot of other California natives. Um, unfortunately, I have no easy answer to, to dealing with our subterranean friends. <laughs> um, awesome. So next question is from Jessica. They want to know, how do you recommend documenting solar exposure throughout the year? Great question. Um, I've done it in a very, I'm curious as to say, I've, I've done it in a very un- professional way. So I'm curious if you know something that might be a little bit more helpful. Um, just like, like I've just done through observation or using like chalk or paint and just like painting like my fence. Um, is there a method that you've done, Connor? Oh, I love that. And then that way you're always seeing it when you're when you're out in the landscape. Mm -hmm. um, what I what I learned is um, when you're so uh, on your slide that you had sectors. Um, folks might remember there are these kind of almost like a Pac-Man shape of lines around the house on that layer of map. So like when I'm making a landscape design, I have my base map and then I use like tracing paper and I make lots of other layers that focus on different things. So when I do a sector analysis, for example, I'm having two different um, sort of partial circles that are showing like from that bird's eye view, what point directionally is the sun rising and setting? And then the like the curved part of the arc is showing where the sun travels. And then I'll use a different, so I'll do that for the summer or like where the sun will be on the summer solstice. Um, and then I'll do it in a different color for around the winter solstice. There are a lot of ways to figure out um, how the sun is moving across your landscape. Um, as you suggested, Corey, I mean, if you have the ability to wait a year and just observe it, you're going to be way more in touch with your landscape um, than otherwise. But there are also lots of tools like apps you can get on your phone that you can punch in a date and it'll show you how the sun travels, which is totally valid as well. Okay, um, we've got a couple questions from Lori. I think these came up during the sheet mulching portion. So Lori wants to know, what do you use for edging? And then 
if there's existing drip irrigation, do you leave the irrigation line accessible? So I'm guessing they mean kind of above everything mm -hmm. or above the cardboard. Um, for edging, we use like kind of a shovel. <laughs> um, and I know for the, what I can speak on the drip irrigation, you do want to cover your lines because um, the sun, the heat, you don't want to damage them or certain like rodents come and can get attracted to them and can damage the lines. Um, accessible from the cardboard. I can't remember the the recipe for if you want to just under the mulch. Maybe Connor, you can speak upon that. Yeah, and so so we have first. I'd just say like we have some really excellent sheep mulching resources that are like a step by step. All the things you need to know that we'll send out in the follow up email as well as. Um, a webinar recording that explains for folks who don't have existing drip irrigation and want to do this process, how to convert a sprinkler system to drip irrigation, which is um, a really valuable resource that our colleague Serena presented on. But um, I, yeah, so you want your irrigation lines beneath your mulch, but definitely on top of the cardboard, because if you have leaks, you need to be able to to fix them. And if you have it under your cardboard, you won't even necessarily know that you have a leak. Um, but like you were saying, Corey, if you cover them with mulch, it protects them from various elements. And then, um, yeah, for, for edging, that'll also be in our sheet mulching resource, but just a shovel or like a, I find trenching shovels, which are just kind of the narrower head, can be really useful for that process. Um, edging is sometimes a hard thing to talk about, a visual aid. Um, is great and we have that on the sheet mulching resource that we'll send you hopefully that um, helps. Wendy asks is black mulch uh, detrimental to soil or is it okay to use? Um, Do you, I'm, I'm wondering if they mean like the the dyed black mm. mulch is that what you? Wendy if you're still here I'll check the chat maybe can clarify um yes. yes okay do you want to answer that one Corey um yeah I would just I'm just getting all my thoughts together so basically uh if it's if it's dyed um it can, you know, leach into your soil. So you want to make sure that you're using like the most organic or, or natural um, elements that you can to really um, support those living organisms which are cohabitating um, within the, the microbial biome that's happening down below. And ultimately, as below, as above. So whatever you're feeding into the soil is ultimately what you're going to be feeding into your plants as well. Um, so it also has to do like what is accessible, right? Or if there's a price point that you're wanting to stay between. Um, that's, that's what I would say though to it, taking into consideration um, the options that you can choose from. Do you wanna add more to this comment? I would just say that typically what we use at Daily Axe and what we recommend to people is arbor mulch, which is, basically a fancy word for wood chips. I, usually they've been partially composted. Um, these are the, the consider, it's considered the most fire safe kind of mulch. There's no such thing as fireproof mulch, but this would be your best option in that regard. And um, just for creating fungal habitat and adding nutrients to the soil and retaining water, really checks all the boxes. And you can often get it for free you know, there's so many arborists working in Sonoma County every day on private property, public property, working with PG&E. There's so much arbor mulch just like waiting around the county to be utilized. So um, it won't have the same aesthetic as the black mulch if that's what you're interested in, but um, I think it's, you know, elegant in its own rustic way. <laughs> If you are living in the Bay Area, really great resource is over by Cesar Chavez uh, Regional Park. Um, right across from this hotel, there's just mounds of organic compost and mulch 
where people can just like come and bring their trucks or their beds and just like fill it up. So I check out your community resources um, as well. It's available. It's a free options. Okay, we have a question here about adjuda or ajuga as a drought resistant ground cover instead of lawn. And I did some Googling because this is not a species <laughs> that I'm familiar with. Yeah, I'm not either. I found that is um, invasive in a lot of parts of the US, but I didn't see it on the um, California Invasive, Invasive Plant Council, I think is the mm -hmm. acronym. I didn't see it on their website. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure there. We can do a little more digging and try to send something in the follow-up email. Um, there are lots of other options, certainly for water-wise lawn alternatives. Um, so we can send a resource on that as well. We, I've worked with different kinds of time mostly, but there are certainly lots of other options. Okay. Kathy says they have garden measurements, a design and plant list already. Can we recommend an app or a website that helps you calculate how many plants will fit in a specific space so I know how many of each plant to purchase? That's a great question. Also, Kathy, all power to you for having all that done. That's really great. Um, I'll be honest, I don't know. That's on, that. I'm happy to look into options and resources. I don't know off the top of my head, um, but I think that that'd be a really great tool and resource to utilize. That's Connor, maybe you know. Yeah, I've never heard of anything like this. And kind of what I'm, what's occurring to me when I'm thinking about this is a tool like that might work if you had like a rectangular planting space and you just wanted to cram all of the plants in right next to each other and like maximizing your use of space. Um, but there are just so many variables, mm -hmm. both in like the plants themselves, like you need to know what a plant's typical growth size and habit are, and also know that the conditions of your site play a huge role in deciding how big your plant will grow, what shape it'll take. And I, I, if there were a tool that could somehow like work in your design sense, that would be incredible. But I, I don't know, I feel like it would be tough to, to convey to it like how you wanna space things, what kind of look you're going for. Yeah. Um, but maybe there is something like that. I'm happy to look into it and just another suggestion is going to, um, Kathy, going to like local nurseries and getting their opinions and um, reference points. Um, they know what does really well. Um, there's also just gardeners associations, but like by counties that you can reach out um, to and like Lots of Facebook groups, garden, gardening uh, Facebook groups that you can kind of get, begin to plug into and ask like, hey, I'm trying to grow a Mexican bush sage. Uh, what do you, what have, how have you seen it um, be successful? I'm in zone nine or I'm in Sebastopol. Um, what do you think? And be just to, to create that community and see what, what has worked for other people. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Corey. That, um, that made me think of the Master Gardeners program. So like the, you know, the we here we have the UC Master Gardeners, but this is a program that exists in other states as well. Um, I would, my experience of people who are in the Master Gardeners community is that they are like incredible people who are more than happy to help you under like any circumstance. So I wouldn't be surprised if there was someone you could get on the phone with or email exchange or even meet in person with and go over your your measurements and your design and say like this is what I'm working with can you help me figure out how many of each to purchase um, there actually is a pretty good app called seek or seeking um, and it's really great too if you're just like in the neighborhood and you're like oh it's a beautiful plant what is it you can have your phone around it and it'll bring up um, iNaturalist. Hmm. It's powered by iNaturalist. 
Um, and you can post pictures or there's like forums and just people that are plant enthusiasts that live for these questions. Um, so that's a, a good app that I can think of or a site to resource. Yeah, and we'll we'll share the the ones that have come up here. When I see Leslie in the chat is sharing some resources. Oh, Chip Drop, thank you for that one. And then, um, yeah, the Garden Sense program. Oh, and you have already worked with the Master Gardeners. Excellent. Um, well, we will share those links again in the follow up for everyone. Um, okay, we're we're past seven, but um, we can definitely answer these last two questions if if you are still here and sticking around. So. Um, this is one, I don't, I don't think we have to go to, into too much detail. This is a good one for the follow-up email as well, but Wendy is looking for books and resources that outline native plants and would show, you know, photos and growth habit expectations for plants and, um, all that sort of things. There are, there are so many excellent, excellent resources, um, and we can put a bunch in here, um, but. Corey, do you have any favorites you wanted to shout out really quickly? Sorry, not off the top of my head. <laughs> I'll no probably worries. add some into the, the follow-up email. Yeah, yeah, that I think that we'll be able to capture a bunch there. Um, yeah, it's a, I feel like every year there are more books published on California native plants. Mm -hmm. um, great topic to be publishing on though. <laughs> okay, and Last we have here, well, actually really quickly, um, I see in the chat, Leslie is the coordinator of Garden Sense free consultations. So um, for everyone who's still here, keep that in mind, we have resources and allies in our community who can help us. And we will definitely include um, an email to get in touch with, um, if not Leslie, with other folks in the Garden Sense program. So thank you for, for calling that out. And then last but not least, suggestions for getting rid of unwanted blackberries. You won't need to go to the gym. <laughs> um, really digging it out by the roots um, or uh, suppressing it with cardboard. I know you're saying something about solarization, Connor, which is a good, I, I've not done that practice yet. Always done the digging up by the roots. Yeah, my experience with blackberries is the only thing I've seen be successful is um, is digging other than in cases of like big wild ecosystems where like reintroducing beavers changed the flow of water, which let willows take back over where blackberries have moved in. So, yeah, I would say dig them out. I feel like um, I've never tried solarizing blackberries. I'm not sure. Um, how they would, the thorns might not play with the plastic well, but um, I think it's worth a shot. Anything's worth a shot because if you came up with a good fix, people would be very happy to know about it. <laughs> Noble um, Peace Prize. <laughs> right, right. My method is um, I submit and I just eat the berries. <laughs> <laughs> it's good for the bees and you're going to get blackberry honey if you are stewarding a beehive mm -hmm. um, or their birds are going to be very thankful. Yeah. All right, we're going to wrap up. William, I see your message in the chat, and it was great to meet you in Katadi a few weeks ago. Um, we will definitely follow up with you. Thank you for, I didn't know you were here. We had a bunch of people on the call. I didn't look through the attendee list. So thanks for coming up, and we'll definitely be in touch. Hi, everyone. Thank you for making this a great first webinar and help letting me facilitate the space. Thank you. All right, have a great night, everyone. I just end it? Yep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>